thoughts arising? And what I should probably say, by the way, is that I don't think we particularly need to discuss whether what I've said is valid or not. I mean, it might just be the case that some of the things I've said inspire mm. thoughts yeah. and comments. It's not about, you need to tell me, am I, am I sure? That's not why I'm here. It's just really, you know, let's, yeah, yeah. let's have a discussion. Yeah. <coughs> yes, please. I just wanted to make sure that I understand one of your <coughs> last uh, comments about the, some of the absences in political ecology is uh, mm, connecting political ecology with the uh, anti globalization movement or anti capitalism movement. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Or? In, in yes, in, in certain contributions, and I've pointed to three, there is an interesting absence. Uh, in recognition of and discussion of um, a set of, and it's not just outside the university by the way, but a set of movements that um, have interesting ideas about alternative futures and are hopeful that those futures can be somehow created. And political ecology does not write about those. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there are certain strands in contemporary Marxist thinking that contemporary Marxist thinking that takes the future climate change and the scale of future climate change seriously, that strangely oh, don't want to entertain yeah. the possibility that that future can be direct, go in several different ways. There's a certain fatality about it. And I'm curious as to why that is. Fatalism, sorry, not fatality. Fatalism. With respect to Dan, books where I work, which I don't know, but with this argument that uh, capitalism will continue working no matter what because it finds opportunities to thrive even under destruction. Mm -hmm. For me, that, and I'm not trained in, in the Marxist line of thinking, but I've, I've, read, I've read your work, I've read other people's work, but for me, what, what, what always uh, is difficult for me to understand is the exact definition of capitalism, the idea of Capital searching for capital or money searching for money it seems to me so broad that, of course, it seems that under a variety of scenarios it might continue happening. But I don't understand when it's going to be the distinguishing line, when it's going to be still money searching for money, but perhaps in a very confined scale. Yeah. And it will no longer be capital, it will be something new, no? Yeah. So yeah. I think also whether capitalism will continue depends on how you define capitalism, how broad you define and how narrow you define. It absolutely agreed, uh, except what I would say to that is that the kind of Marxists that I've been mentioning today would be very clear that about their definition of capitalism, and it's one that I would certainly agree with. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever word you want to use, but what they're talking about you know, is a system that is predicated on um, people having to sell their ability to work in order to live. Competition between firms, which spurs endless technical innovation, and finally, the search for profit as the ultimate goal of production. Accumulation for accumulation's sake, to use the famous phrase from Marx. Um, so, if you can eliminate all those things, then you don't have capitalism. You, you might have something else that's not very nice, but you don't have capitalism. Uh, and the world would surely be different in a number of extremely non trivial ways. So, I mean, so that's the kind of understanding of capitalism that these people are talking about. But I do take your point, you know, there, there are elements of, I mean, this has always been the case, there are elements of any mode of production that will always somehow live on into a different mode of production because, you know, there aren't historical breaks, you don't have sharp endings. You know, whatever people say, life just doesn't seem to work that way. Yeah. You've mentioned that uh, future climate change uh, poses to us the question of linking the future with uh, present in innovative ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that there is an element of speculation in that. You are calling for speculative theories, so to speak. In, yeah, I'm not sure that the word is mm. uh, exact, but yeah, there is an element of speculation in that. And what I'm yeah. wondering is, and trying to link with your final remark on the causes of the unpolitical imaginary, is would that require changing academic practice as well? The way that we write and way, the way we construct theory, and as a result, would that require changing university as an institution, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, world, world where what is valued is a product that can be evaluated 
upon certain criteria, well defined, and so on and so forth. And how we do it, I mean, that, yeah, that would be a really broad question how we go on doing that, or if any suggestions on that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so, kind of two, two aspects of that. Um, so, so, in respect to the first one about um, future climate change changing, potentially changing the whole way we think and act in the present. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Some of you may disagree, but if you believe the claims made by the likes of Kevin Anderson and Alice Bowes, I mean, I was really shocked, I must say. You know, when I, when I first heard Kevin Anderson talk about four degrees C, you know, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it for about three weeks. You know? um, and it made me think, uh, how complacent have I been? You know, what, where's my head been? You know, why have I not really paid attention to this? You know, after all, I'm, a, I'm a geographer, I'm supposed to be interested in these things in a very, in a very deep way. Um, but one of the, so one of the, so if you take those claims seriously, one of the things that really interests me is how can we somehow consider a future that we, that we know is going to be changed considerably, but we don't know the fine details of it. How can we take that seriously now? How can we take 40 years, 50 years, 60 years down the line seriously now? We have to, because we're already making that future right now. Our fathers and grandfathers, and, you know, they, they all helped to make that future, and they're, they're dead. So all that's programmed in. That's cumulative emissions. So how do we do that? And the, the reason in the presentation I said this is unprecedented is because I, I, I can't think of any generation in history that has been obliged to think ahead, take the future so seriously because of biophysical change. You know, we think in terms of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, but we, we've never had powerful reason to think actually, we need to think now about 50, 60, 70, 80, 300 years ahead. I mean, this is mind blowing actually. So you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it yet, but somehow you have to take it seriously and, and work with it in the present. And I don't, I don't really know how you do that. And I'm scratching my head all the time now to think about mm. what does that do to analysis and to theory. Um, so I can recognise the challenge, but I don't really have a sense of what, what the answer might be to that. Um, you, you set the second part of your question on, on what it does to academic work. Um, hmm. Yeah. I made the point at the end that I think, I mean, I love what I do. I'm sure Gavin loves what he does. Um, and I really value the space and time that I get to, to, to think, to study, to be considered and careful in, in what I try to be, in what I say and what I write. On the other hand, I'm acutely aware that um, the way that certainly British universities are configured can make it very challenging to do things in a different way. Um, so it can make it very challenging to not write books and publish journal articles and show up to class on time and do all the very conventional sort of treadmilly things that we do. Um, and how do you change that? Well, you change that with great difficulty structurally, or if you, do, if you try to do things differently individually, then there is a risk involved with that around career progression and all the rest of it. And we know people whose careers have suffered mightily you know, in all sorts of different ways, because they wanted to be different. Um, I think what I would favour is a university system that was less obsessed with the production of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, some people disagree with me on this, but I actually welcome the fact that the British government is, is now trying to value uh, the impact of our research in the wider society. I don't necessarily agree with the way it's being measured, but I think to institutionally support that is a valuable thing because it allows people like me and Gavin and the other people who've been involved in delivering these seminars to feel that it's, it's, it's actually okay to do what many of us want to do anyway, which is to get out of rooms like this and be elsewhere, talking to different people. So. Thank you, thanks. What, just, just a brief observation on that, your point about considering time. Yeah, there are our, um, discussions yesterday from the climate activist groups. Mm. Their response to that, what happens when we try <coughs> to consider time, 
is that one often gets the argument that there is no time and that that's what shuts down effectively yeah. debate about the form yeah. of the, the politics. Yeah. Um, that's their response to that. But you, you seem to be suggesting that actually it's not about we don't have time, it's more about how do we consider futurity, how do we get our heads around those much longer periods of impact and implications of activity today. I mean, yeah, yeah, so the idea that there is, no, there is not enough time is, is, a, is in a sense is absurd. Mm. I mean, relative to what? Mm. Of course there's not enough time. <laughs> of course there's not enough time. Um, and bad things will happen because mm. there's not enough time. But, in, but, but there is enough time in that we can make decisions in the here and now that will change those futures in, in very meaningful ways. Mm. The problem is we don't, we don't know how because we're not there, we're here. That's the gamble. Let's take some more questions. Um, Hugo, yes. Uh, yes, and in, in, in the same question, uh, who can act or who have to act about the uh, uh, climate change? Uh, mm. our, our research, many of the research in political ecology are about local communities, and we know that the local communities don't have enough power to defend their own land. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, uh, the we, we're going to talk about the working class. Mm -hmm. So, who have to protect or take action now? Yeah. The state, yeah. the large international companies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the civil society, the environmentalists. I totally agree with you, but at this moment, probably because we are not thinking about the future now, uh, we don't know who will be or who could be the people that can take some action. Shall we, can we get some more yeah, yeah, ideas yeah, off the yeah, table so people can to chip in? Yeah, um, Giacomo. I, I, wa I want to uh, reinforce uh, the point on the anti globalization movement. Because I think for some years, yesterday we were thinking about, after the discussion with the climate change activists, um, that e even if they were trying to, to say to us that they escaped the apocalypse. Uh, mm -hmm. claim they finally they are getting it because what they are working on is exactly what the agenda of climate change is imposing no so they are investing their energy let's say and not on urban local concrete <coughs> problems of day everyday life but on something that is put on agenda uh, by this climate change uh, discourses. So, what is your take? Because I think partially these people are part of, or were part of, uh, anti-globalization movement. So they yeah. have moved to this topic because now is the really important topic to, to stay in, in the world, in the movement. So I don't think that it's just a matter of some intellectual. I mean, we also, uh, as activists or people, part of anti-globalization, we fall down in this trap, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And then the second um, point that I agree, for example, my criticism also to the answer of Eric to the apocalypse. And uh, this catastrophic narrative is they always suppose that all the anthropology respond to the same catastrophes in the same way. Yeah. And this is in some ways a political imaginary mm -hmm. what is opening up. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is your take on this? I mean, because this idea that we all react in the same way uh, to an apocalypse is also, I think, is uh, open up a political imaginary of possibilities in different ways. Yeah. Should we get a few yeah. other ideas? Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Other, other thoughts, comments? I said. It was quite provocative and then only challenging. Um, you talk about theory and, and how years of, of our time we spent going through the education system and obviously we are product of our system. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering like, um, how do we escape that trap? Because obviously <coughs> our thinking has been shaped over time and, and, and all, all kinds of subjects so information that we've been exposed to. And now engaging with our way again, trying to understand how the theories that we create and how that impacts or restricts the way we look at the world. 
how can we escape that trap? Um, and secondly, in a very, obviously because I know you've been engaging a lot with the subject on nature, but of course you've tackled it just in person today, but mm -hmm. um, reading on from Maria's and Eric's presentation and, 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 and your, your thoughts about nature and how obviously the concept of nature and the complex around that, like nature is not, it's not natural, it's mm -hmm. something that's obviously produced and it's a social natural in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's quite unsettling when I read some of the work that comes from the political ecology and we still use this concept of nature. So I just want, I, I was just wondering what are your thoughts about this notion of nature? Do you think it's a way that has to be punished or that has to be thrown out of the window or mm -hmm. there's still some use for it we can, we can use it or engage with it or we, we need something completely different to refer to something that's that's what is not natural. So that's just my my side question in a way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to pick up any, any of those? Um yeah, oh god this is could go horribly wrong. Um <laughs> there's a lot there, isn't there? Yeah. Um okay. Yeah, I mean this this thing about um <coughs> agents of change which you also touched upon, agents of change, who, you know, who, who, who's trying to change the world. Um, you know, one, in, one, one interpretation of why the likes of Dan and Nathan and Eric are, according to my reading, so kind of glum, or kind of limited in their horizons, um, is because you might say, objectively speaking, the, the, there is not much of an organised force out there that can actually do anything. Um, and certainly if you look at West European countries, not all of them, I mean Greece is obviously having a hell of a time. Um, one, of the, one of the great co-opters of dissent is, is wealth. Um, you know, we're in a recession in this country and yet actually, look around you, you know, people do, a lot of people doing pretty good. Really. Not everyone, a lot of people doing pretty good. Um, so you could actually completely reverse what I've tried to say today and, and, and argue that actually this, this rather unpolitical, weakly political sense of the, what's possible simply reflects the fact that in very large pockets of the world, particularly the wealthiest countries in the world, there is virtually no serious political opposition. Now that's really depressing. Um, and part of me sort of believes that. Um, part, part of me believes that. Or to rephrase it, there's lots of political dissent, but it's fragmented, it's dispersed, and it's very small scale. Like the transition times movement in the UK, which is extremely worthy, but you know, it's sort of in the in the interstices. It's not really changing government decision making. It's not changing corporate practice particularly. In fact, in many ways, it's having to cozy up to big corporates to deliver the changes that it'd like to see. So, yeah. Um, now that may not be the case in 15, 20, 25 years. You know, the beauty of history is it's, it's about change, particularly in the capitalist world. So I'm always optimistic that somehow um, things can improve. But I won't say much more on opposition than that. Um, uh, can you just remind me the second part of your question, please? Because yeah. you said two the things. The second part is uh, the hypothesis that to a catastrophic narrative. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah I mean... Always the same answer to this catastrophic narrative. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's completely wrong. Because yeah. you cannot see different reaction yeah. to the catastrophes. Yeah, well, with, as with any universal claim, it, it can cut in two ways. It can either be incredibly useful, well, useful for who, uh, and disempowering, or uh, disempowering for others, or very empowering for some and disempowering for still others. So, I mean, Eric's point is that the language of blanket catastrophe is a great pacifier. You know, if you scare people and you say, actually, but we need to do something now, this is his argument, I'm not saying I agree, then, you know, it's, it's easier to say, well, we need to do this, this, and this, and people go, okay, yeah, we'll do that. Um, but you're absolutely right that you know, that's not going to play out equally everywhere on the planet. And Mike Hume, in, in, the, in a book called Why We Disagree About Climate Change, and he's a scientist, Mike Hume, but he's very critical of these universalizing discourses, including the discourse of science itself. You know, that there, there are, these are the global emissions. This is the average temperature increase. There will be big changes everywhere. He's, he's very critical of that. 
And he makes the point that actually what climate change means will have to be embedded in different local histories, different traditions, and different circumstances. And people have to sort of work with the idea in their own ways. And in some places, it's going to be an idea that um, hopefully forces major changes in the way in which we live our lives. In other places, um, it will be accommodated in, in less dramatic, in a less dramatic fashion. So I think as with all, all these universal claims, you have to just look at who's making them and you know, what are their purposes and ends. And they're not all nefarious, of course, but in some cases. So, I'm sorry, about other thoughts? There was, yes, right. Yeah, um, you asked about nature. Well, in the first, just remind me the first, don't, don't have to say the whole thing again, just quickly remind the first part of your comment. Yeah, just this tribe, you know, introducing theory. That's right, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, I mean, where does theory get done? Um, where, where does sort of, quote, big analysis get performed these days? I, I would suggest mostly in universities. Mm -hmm. not, not exclusively, but mostly in universities. Um, it always interests me that on, on the occasions I meet activists, it's usually when they've come into the university because they want some theory. Um, so it offers something important, but, it, but it's often offered in these kind of institutions, these kind of spaces. Um, so you ask, you know, can we change ourselves? Because we're products, of, inevitably we're products to some extent of the, of the environments in which we, we are raised and the ones that we inhabit. Um, you can do it individually, and I made the comment before about taking risks. Now that, you've got to be brave. Um, and um, I understand this part. You can do that. The thing is going on is the right click. There is it. Okay. It's just once it's frozen. Anyway, I'll carry talking. If you can get the, oh, yeah. Let's get the first slide going here. That end show. I'll just go back to the first slide. And this, very, I think, very nice uh, quotation from Jeff Mann, um, which is one of my two epigrams. Um, from beginning, from beginning, where's that gone? Oh, oh yeah, okay. So here's, here's Jeff Mann. So you can check this on an individual level, okay? And it's a bit scary. So he says, Marx makes one acutely aware of the need for action so radical it's quite frightening. Um, to take him seriously as a person of the left is to experience the knowledge that one's world, especially if one is among the more fortunate, does not match one's moral claims, and the only way to make it do so would be to take risks and attempt the kind of change that it's most likely to require throwing it all away. This is very unsettling, and we're not unreasonably attempted to turn instead to something that allows us to contemplate the chasm between the is and the ought without demanding the same kind of fear and trembling. But there's a different way, and th this is the way that academics are actually not very good at achieving at the moment, which is to do something collectively, so that individuals don't have to bear all the risk of doing things differently. And that is about organising the, the way in which universities produce knowledge, the norms against which we are judged, how we are valued. And that, that, that really, at the end of the day, has to involve structural change. It has to be a collective enterprise. So if you step out, it's not because you yourself have, have you know, been unbelievably brave admirable though that is, it's because actually you are, the environment around you permits it because you've organised to create that environment. Um, and I used to be a member of the, what used to be one of the two major unions that represent British academics, and we've just got a very, I mean Pat's older than me, but we've got a very bad history in this country uh, of organising politically. We're very supine in the face of central government policy makers, and that's been true for a really long time. Sorry, that's really de that's a good down. Um, on the nature question, um, I don't like yes/no answers, so I'm not going to say the language of nature is useless and we should get rid of it. Um, I actually think it can serve some very useful purposes, and actually, it's one of the arguments I make in my book, Making Sense of Nature, that we don't necessarily have to abandon the language of nature, the natural, etc., etc. Um, however. Um, in a climate change world, it's very clear that nature in the stereotypical sense of the untouched simply won't exist, and you have to be a bit of a, a, bit of a fool not to spot that. So as I'm sure you recognise, some of the more interesting debates about how we engage with the non-human world do dispense with the concept of nature altogether. For example, I've been reading a book by Emma Maris, who's based in Seattle, I think, called Rumbunctious Nature. 
and it's about, and I mentioned conservation biology in this presentation, it's about forms of nature conservation that have no truck with the idea of natural species, natural ecosystems, that actually revel in the entanglement between us, plants, insects, animals, and kind of work with that mess. And that's quite inspiring. Of course, though, if you're a hardcore conservation biologist who doesn't want nature to be destroyed, you recoil in horror because you've got no baseline against which to judge what's good and bad ecological practice. When, when you were speaking and you were making the point about what theory should be, you drew this distinction between theory as we should be builders rather than excavators, and Harvey's idea of well, and, and sorry, builds and excavators, mm -hmm. and theory as, uh, as being the, the role of the insurgent architect, mm -hmm. is the phrase you used. And I'm thinking about what, in, what Entitle tries to do, and to bring together theory and, and practice. I think that might be useful for us as a group to kind of reflect on well, what role we, we, as propagators of theory in some way, and people are engaged in different contexts with practice, mm. what we imagine our theoretical practices to be, what are we trying, mm. trying to mm. achieve? And I wonder if people have thoughts on that based on you know, our own practical experience. How do we imagine theory? Does it fit this model of the insurgent architect? And can I just say that one of, one of the contexts for me making that point is that in my, my education, which is very interdisciplinary, but dominated by social science readings um, and some humanity stuff, there is a massive focus on explanation and analysis yeah. and a, a much smaller focus on proposing, quote, feasible alternatives. Um, I don't know why that is. I don't know what it is about members of certainly the social science communities that I've encountered that makes them reticent to venture substantive comments about making things different and better. Mm. And I think that's a big feature of the kind of Marxism that I've kind of bathed myself in uh, mm. for the last 25 years. Maybe in early generations there's much more focus on the future, socialism change. Right. Pat certainly right. knows that much better than I do. But in the recent period, I think much less so. And, and, and am I right in thinking then, from your, your comments about um, uh, Kevin Anderson and Alice Bowe's piece, the kind of the, the, the normative form of, of science, mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that as, as a, um, is, is that, that that branch of scientific inquiry is doing something that critical social science is, is backing away from, but it's actually making claims on what ought to happen in a way that perhaps critical social science should be doing. Is, is that what you see going on there? Uh, well, I think, I think there is quite a bit of critical social science that's doing it, but there could be an awful lot more. Mm. Um, so I mentioned Bruno, Bruno Latour in 2004. Again, some of you may have seen this and read it. Most of you probably haven't. Uh, Why Critiquers Were Out of Steam, something like that, was the title of the course. I think it's a critical, critical inquiry of the journal, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you know, Latour is very guilty of making overdrawn distinctions between things, and I've done it a bit today. Uh, he uses them as heuristics to make arguments. But one of, the, one of the claims that he makes is that for far too long, and he implicates himself in this, um, social scientists have been obsessed with debunking, revealing, explaining. Um, why don't they try to assemble, to suggest the new, to, make, to bring that new into being as part of some wider kind of project? Um, so, I do think it's there. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting literature that's proposing alternatives. Um, I mean, you and I are geographers. Actually, there's, there's, there's very little of geography, I must say. Very little. Um, and probably even in, in places like sociology, which I also read into quite heavily. Um, we had an interesting example. Think of this idea about building and assembling, and just thinking of some of the presentations we heard yesterday. So, Marty, there's Marty. So, so in thinking about you know, assembling something new, and in, in the case that you described of northern, northern Peru and um, um, the Amazon, yeah, assembling something new with had a strong methodological component. It's about producing new forms of data that allow claims to be made that produce change, kind of the negotiated outcomes over who can, who can say what's happening in, around environmental mm -hmm. contamination in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So that assembly role is not necessarily about new concepts. It, it can be very much about very practical interventions that produce sets of data, that produce new knowledge yeah. that allow people to contest claims. Yeah. 
So there's some really, I'm just thinking there's some very concrete ways in which that acts of assembling something new mm. are already taking place in the sorts of work that we're doing as a group. Yeah. Um, other thoughts? Yes, Irina. But, uh, since we are talking about case studies, and many of these case, case studies uh, in all over the world are actually uh, insurgent people, right? I mean, we can and be. I mean, we can be an intermediary uh, between, uh, you know, academia and and what's called marginal knowledge or subaltern knowledge or whatever marginalized knowledge. And I think that in itself is an assemble because you have a different language, you have different um, way of thinking, different way of life that are are being uh, forgotten or marginalized. So in that sense, it's a creative wor work of an academic person mm -hmm. only to make that knowledge uh, heard, visible, yeah. and so on, right? Yeah. Yeah. But for that, I think maybe we should not ask the question who. I mean, ever since Foucault, I mean, power is not, you know, a center, it's capillary. So it's, you know, just to accept this thing that we all have somehow a power to make things circulate. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, other, other observations? Okay. Yes, Isaac. Um, just to follow on from my earlier question, which you've probably answered and known, um, I've always had this constant um, antagonism within myself, um, spending more time within the ivory towers, as it were, of, mm -hmm. of the academic um, environment, and, and linking up the noise that we produce to, to practice. Mm -hmm. So this is in between um, academia and practice. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you want to be identified, you know, in a certain way as an academic. You produce your work, and you want to affiliate yourself with a certain niche of of, of academic practice or, or theory, as it were. So, how much do you reach out, and and, and 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 how does that actually affect your relationships with? Um, because obviously, you might have multiple identities, and as an academic, but at the same time, you want to touch. Uh, based with reality, mm -hmm. but in some way that can affect the way you are accepted within a certain mm -hmm. niche, mm -hmm. um, within your academic field. So how do you negotiate those multiple identities as an academia to be accepted within um, within a particular niche that you want to be identified with, but at the same time you want your work to make impact on the ground. Um, so obviously you've been in academia for quite a long time, how do you negotiate those multiple identities? I just, I just don't think there's a general answer to that uh, question, um, and we, we could probably identify interesting examples that would give you very different answers to your question. Um, I'll, I'll give you a positive one, if it's of any help. We've got a visitor here next week um, called Jane Wills from uh, Queen Mary College, University of London, uh, who, who also has uh, kind of Marxism in her DNA, intellectual DNA. Um, and she, what she's been able to do is align her research and the demands of her institution, publication, etc., with the political aspirations of um, individuals and, and communities that she's been interested in. And she's, she's been doing activist research on li the living wage in East London, including ensuring that her own university college, Queen Mary College, itself has now a living wage policy. So. I'm not saying it was easy for her, but the, but it was kind of seamless because she was she was able without contradiction to to intervene in the situation that she was interested in and still use all that material to meet the kind of normal standards of academic life around publications, peer review, and all the rest of it. Um, you know, if you were here next well, you are here next week. I mean, she's actually someone very good to talk to about how she achieved that. Was it luck? Was it just damn hard work? Um, but it's obviously worked for her, and it's worked for the people who she's, and it's not just her, who she's sort of worked with and assisted and enabled to create something positive. So it's, it's not just the campus, it's the wider East London area and its immigrants, and it's ensuring that major employers do offer, and they weren't, a, a living wage for the generally crappy jobs that those people have to do, like cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, cleaning windows, sweeping floors, cleaning out toilets, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great. Okay. So what I think we'll do now is bring bring this to a close. I'd like to thank Noel very much indeed. Thoughts arising. And what I should probably say, by the way, is that I don't think we particularly need to discuss whether what I've said is valid or not. I mean, it might just be the case that some of the things I've said inspire mm. thoughts yeah. and comments. It's not about, you need to tell me, am I, am I sure? That's not why I'm here. It's just really, you know, let's, yeah, yeah. let's have a discussion. Yeah. <coughs> yes, please. I just wanted to make sure that I understand one of your <coughs> last comments about the, some of the absences in political ecology is the connecting political ecology with the um, anti-globalization movement or anti-capitalism movement, is that correct? Is that what you said? Or? In, in yes, in, in certain contributions, and I've pointed to three, there is an interesting absence uh, in recognition of and discussion of um, a set of, and it's not just outside the university by the way, but a set of movements that um, have interesting ideas about alternative futures and are hopeful that those futures can be somehow created. And political ecology does not write about those. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying... I think also whether capitalism will continue depends on how you define capitalism, how broad you define and how narrow you define. It, it absolutely agreed. Uh, so <coughs> what I would say to that is that the kind of Marxists that I've been mentioning today would be very clear that about their definition of capitalism, and it's one that I would certainly agree with. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever word you want to use, but what they're talking about, you know, is a system that is predicated on um, people having to sell their ability to work in order to live. Mm -hmm. Competition between firms, which spurs endless technical innovation, mm -hmm. and finally, the search for profit as the ultimate goal of production. Or what because it finds opportunities to thrive even under destruction. Mm. For me, that, and I'm not trained in, in the Marxist line of thinking, but I've, I've, read, I've read your work, I've read other people's work. But for me, what, what, what always uh, is difficult for me to understand is the exact definition of capitalism. The idea of capital searching for capital or money searching for money <laughs> seems to me so broad that, of course, it seems that under a variety of scenarios it might continue happening, but I don't understand when it's going to be the distinguishing line, when it's going to be still money searching for money, but perhaps in a very confined scale. Yeah. It will no longer be capitalism, it will be something new, no? Yeah. So yeah. what? Is that there are certain strands in contemporary Marxist thinking, that contemporary Marxist thinking that takes the future climate change and the scale of future climate change seriously, that strangely oh. don't want to entertain the possibility that that future can be direct through in several different ways. There's a certain fatality about it. And I'm curious as to why that is. Fatalism, sorry, not fatality. Fatalism. Yeah. Uh, with respect to Dan Book's work, which I don't know, but with this argument that um, capitalism will continue working, no matter